<laughs> In case you don't know me, I'm Rebecca Durham, and I'm a botanist at MPG, and um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about lichens. And probably most of you know what lichens are, but in case you don't, lichens are symbiosis between fungi and a photosynthetic green algae and or cyanobacteria. And there's about 17,000 species um, worldwide, and they grow anywhere where there's a suitable surface and enough light and moisture. So a little bit um, ecological role and background. Um, lichens are um, important forage for small mammals, ungulates, and invertebrates. They build soil and colonize bare surfaces. And cyanolichens, which are, have blue-green algae in them, um, fix nitrogen and make it available um, and add it to the soil. And some birds use lichens as nesting material. And humans have a long history of using lichens for dyes, food source, and medicine. And here's just a, there's a lot of pictures, not, not, no ordinations in this talk, but some pictures. So this is um, um, common freckle pelt, Peltigera aptosa, and it's a cyanolichen. Um, and it's the same lichen, but it, lichens can look a lot different whether they're wet or dry, depending on when the algae gets wet. So lichens um, can be a valuable food source, especially for um, deer and elk. And there's been some studies documenting this. Um, uh, specifically in western Montana, there was a study by Ward and Markham that um, they built exclosures and they looked at um, the lichen biomass inside and outside the exclosures and found that inside the exclosures uh, there was, you know, significant more and more lichens and that the, the deer and elk were using that for forage. And a study in Maine um, showed that up to 30% of um, winter forage by ungulates was, was um, lichens. And this is a picture of Briaria horsehair lichen, which is common in the forest. And this is also, as an aside, a, a good survival food if you're ever stuck and you can, I guess, cook it in a pit and, it, and you can survive the whole winter, so I don't think it tastes very good though. Um, lichens can also indicate air quality. Um, they show signs of stress and damage from air pollutants and they can be completely extirpated by poor air conditions. And common pollutants studied with macro lichens include um, nitrogen compounds, sulfur compounds, fluorine, <coughs> certain metals, and volatile organic compounds. And lichens have a, different species have a different sensitivity level to pollutants. Um, here we have on the, on the right, um, elegant camouflage lichen, a melanohalia, and they thrive in, in, in areas of high nitrogen. And on the left, um, beard lichens, Usnea leponica, and they're sensitive to um, excess, excess nitrogen. So um, just, what, just in general, um, we've, Nitrogen-sensitive genera such as Usnea and Briaria and Peltigera are seen in high abundance on the ranch, so suggesting that there's not a problem with excess, excess nitrogen. So lichens have a variety of novel secondary compounds, and these have been use, useful um, by humans and for dyes in medicine. And this is a picture of wolf lichen. I'm sure you've all seen the fluorescent lichen hanging around. Um, and it's very common on exposed conifers and some shrubs. And it's used to dye, even today, used as a dye for um, natural and synthetic fibers. And the, the color is due to vulpinic acid, which is toxic to humans and animals. And the lethal dose for a dog is about 10 fist-sized thalli. So it's, it's um, pretty, pretty poisonous, but most lichen compounds aren't poisonous. And as with plants, um, useful medicinal compounds continue to be discovered. And this is a uh, xanthoparmelia. And uh, if you Google xanthoparmelia, it will come up as a, as a remedy for sexual dysfunction. But there's no scientific studies to back this up. But it has been shown to, um, some compounds isolated from it have been shown to be uh, active against human tumor cells. And this is another species with um, potentially poisonous substances. This is tumbleweed shield lichen. 
And um, in 2004, it was indicated um, as the reason for killing um, hundreds of elk in Wyoming. And it was, it was looked at um, trying to figure out what was the compound and um, there was a study done and I thought maybe it was osmic acid, but it wasn't and they still don't know what it, what it was. But as the name suggests, it, it kind of rolls around. So it can be locally abundant in um, pockets of shrubland. So these chemicals can be used for lichen identification. Um, some common reagents used um, for um, these tests are, are bleach, the C test, potassium hydroxide, the K test, and P-phenyl and a diamine for the P test. And so a color change can indicate if a species, um, if a secondary compound is present. So um, if uh, here's just some cladonia there, some um, cup lichen, and here with the, um, the P test, it's, it's turning colors. So in the dichotomous keys, it can indicate whether it is a certain species or not. But not all species have secondary compounds, so you have to just look at morphology. Um, and this is um, Peltigera canina on the left and Peltigera venosa on the right. So, so you can see the, the, um, like the round apothecia you know, makes this species really um, distinctive as opposed to um, the Peltigera canina. So um, getting into macrolichens at MPG Ranch, um, it was, you know, it kind of goes along with the uh, goal of just, you know, what's, what's out there, you know, lichens are really cool, what, what lichens are growing at the ranch, and um, to help understand, you know, kind of how they all fit in in big picture, and oftentimes um, public land agencies and land managers, they just don't have their, the resources allocated to looking at lichens. Everyone wants to look at bears and birds. They're really cool too, but the lichens are often overlooked. And so, um, so this, this was not a, um, any, any sort of methodical study. It was just, you know, as we were um, look, going out to um, um, sites at the Bird Point Counts or just anywhere they were encountered, um, they were um, collected and um, looked at using um, Dichotomous Keys of Macro Lichens of the Pacific Northwest <coughs> and Lichens of North America, both really cool books if you're interested. And the lichens were um, cataloged and processed for herbarium specimens. This is a photo by Alan, I forgot to uh, credit it. but So some lichens exist in many climate types and are found all, all over the, uh, the world and some are, have distinct geographic ranges. And so on the ranch, we have western montane element and western temperate element distribution types. And um, just looking at where these find, found, there's some general habitats for lichens. Um, these aren't like, you know, habitat types per se, but just um, kind of where we were finding things in dry and most moist forests, grasslands, shrublands, and rock and scree. So the next few slides just kind of go over in general um, some of these habitat types and then we'll get into what was found here. Um, so dry forests, um, sparse tree cover, southern exposure, ponderosa pine, dug fir, nine bark, um, all found here. And moist forests, they have a higher density of trees, higher humidity, north facing slopes, and often the tree species composition, subalpine fir, larch, dug fir, and spruce and there's usually more complex understory and, um, and moss cover. And here's these moist forests where we have more of the um, pendulous epiphytic lichens, such as beard lichen, Briorea. So grasslands offer habitat for soil dwelling lichens, um, and lichens growing as part of biological soil crusts are abundant, um, especially um, interspersed throughout the, grass, the grasslands and shrublands, but also in these high exposed ridges where there's just not a lot of vegetation cover. And old shrublands um, that are, have a, a real, real dense um, sagebrush found a lot, of, a lot of lichen density in there as well, but that was not the case with the younger, younger shrublands. And then scree slopes and rock um, offer a concentration of crustose lichens and some macro lichens. And scree um, and rock are throughout, across all the habitat types throughout the ranch. 
So, so far we've uh, identified 44 macro lichens and you know, really focus on the macro lichens just for the ease of identification so far. And like I said, this isn't, hasn't been a methodical kind of, you know, it's just kind of, hey, what's, what's here? Let's pick this up. Um, so there's many more um, that material that has yet to be even identified and then there's more to encounter. And crustose lichens haven't been looked at at all and that will def probably compose a, like a majority of the diversity on the ranch. So um, I'm not going to go through every species and bore you to death here, but uh, if you if you are interested, um, it, this is this is all uh, on the on the website, so you can go back and, and look at what species have been found. So and then just you know also where where what habitats they were found in. So um, humidity level and habitat type um, can create a different community of lichens, and um, this was seen in a this was, there was a study by Eversman, who's done a lot of lichen work in the, the state, um, that um, lichen density increases with moisture and communities vary with habitat type. And, and this was found at the ranch um, at higher elevation forests with northern aspect, um, have favorable conditions for species, of a di completely different assemblage of species, especially associated with uh, maritime influence such as Briaria. And then the dry southern aspect forests, such as the ponderosa pine forest, have um, um, these are common species found there. So, Notobriaria abbreviata, or okay, foxtail lichen. I'll, I'll try to spare you with the uh, the Latin. Um, foxtail lichen, wolf lichen, and brown-eyed wolf lichen are all really common on like ponderosa pine um, branches. And um, so in the forested areas, the lichens are, live on, um, on, the, on the ground uh, amongst the soil and moss and epiphytically on branches and bark of living and dead trees. And two really common species are um, forked tube lichen and hammered shield lichen. And these were, these were in um, moist and dry forest types as well as um, shrub areas. And then some common ground-dwelling lichens, um, cup lichens, cladonia species, and dog and felt lichens, peltigeras, are common species in the forest as well. And then Briaria, like I said, reaches high density of in moist forest. So some, some conifer species support lichens better than others. Kind of just notice looking around, it's like, why aren't there any lichens on the ponderosa pine bark? It's kind of striking. Um, especially next to some of you know, these, these other trees that are next to each other. And so I looked into it a little bit and there was a study by, um, by Gao that looked at all the um, you know, biochemical characteristics and physical characteristics of the bark <laughs> and found that um, there's really nothing that makes it unsuitable. It, it's just, um, it's the, he attributed due to the, the constant shedding of bark scales. And lichens are, are slow growing, but um, they can reach high densities on undisturbed bark. So here we have um, some, some beard lichen on these trees here. And so these larger ponderosa pines where the bark isn't shedding anymore, um, lichens were found to be establishing there. So that's <laughs> um, concurrent with, with, the, with the findings that um, there's nothing, no reason they can't grow there. It's just so. So once the bark isn't shedding, they, they can establish. And this is another picture of how dense um, wolf lichen can be on um, dug fir trunks. So some species were found um, more on hardwood bark and shrub branches. Um, so this is, these are kind of small, small lichens, so you can't really get a, a very good idea of, of how they look. Um, but uh, Physia ascendens, hooded rosette lichen, and Xanthoria candelaria, shrubby sunburst lichen are common lichens in um, deciduous straws and old sagebrush and bitter branches. And so, like I said, the young shrubs don't have much lichen biomass on their branches. Um, and it's, this might be due just because they colonize and grow so slowly or there might be actually some, some changes, some microclimate changes in um, the dense shrubs. 
And, and some, it was kind of surprising to me that some of these species that are found in the forest are, were, were eventually um, encountered in the sagebrush stands, especially the really, really old, dense ones. Um, I didn't expect that. So some of these, you know, including beard lichen, camouflage lichen, a fork tube lichen, powdered wrinkle lichen, and horsehair lichen. So here's on the left here we have powdered wrinkle lichen um, and and um, elegant camouflage lichen on the right here. So on these old um, sa sagebrush areas, often on the base, there's a lot of real high density of cup lichens and dog lichens um, within also some moss. Um, this is one species that was frequently encountered, trumpet lichen up top here, and often found with pebbled pixie cup. And field dog lichen, Peltiger rufescens, is one of the most common dog lichens at MPG, um, grown. It's found in um, open sites of shrublands and grasslands. And so lichens are also an important component of biological soil crust or cryptogamic crust. And um, it's kind of a, a, a neat a little um, ecological succession on the soil. First, the cyanobacteria and green algae come along, and um, this, they add nitrogen, and the algae um, create some organic matter and structure. And then the lichens and mosses come along, and lichens and cyanobacteria, um, aside from adding the nitrogen, they also increase availability of phosphorus, which is often a limiting nutrient um, in, in, these, um, in the soil. So often, lichens often found in the biological soil crusts include um, cup lichens, cladonia, dog lichens, and a variety of crustose lichens especially um, Peltiger rufescens and um, field dog lichen and pebble pixie cup. So crustose lichens um, often dominate rock and scree, but some macro lichens will grow there. And depending on the aspect and tree cover, um, it will de determine whether it's a moist or, or dry um, scree. And the moist scree can accumulate soil and moss, and then you'll have a, a greater assemblages of macro lichens, including um, these two species here, um, Peltidra malacea, veinless pelt, pebbled pixie cup. So another macro lichen frequently encountered in the um, scree is our, our rock, species of rock tripes, including Umbilicaria hyperborea and Umbilicaria feia. And, um, Rock tripes are, are edible as an emergency survival food and in some um, countries are a delicacy. And these are pretty small that we, that we have, but some of these, um, these rock tripes you know, can be really big and kind of, they kind of look like a big cup growing on rocks. And, and they're a little bit nutty, but uh, I mean, not crazy, but like nutty as in like, like a nut. So they, they're a little bit good, but anyway. <laughs> So um, some, some future directions, um, like I said, this is just the beginning and it wasn't a methodical study. So um, you know, what, what else is growing, growing here? Um, and, and crustose lichens, um, like I said, haven't been addressed at all. So that would be really neat to look at. And um, also lichens at MPG North haven't been looked at as well. And that will um, probably have even greater diversity of macro lichens because it's a little wetter and more um, maritime species up there. And then um, how, do, how do they compare? And some potential, there's a lot of great research you can do with lichens. Some potential research questions are, um, you know, what heavy metals are found and how does this compare to studies um, and what's going on in the area. There was a really interesting study of, um, of heavy metals and pollutions um, out of um, Yellowstone looking at what was found um, there, and um, what associations exist between macro lichen communities and plant communities. Um, are nitrogen levels beneath Siona lichens detectively higher than adjacent soil? There's, there's um, some question of how, you know, once it, it fixes the nitrogen, you know, is it, what's the level there and, and how, um, you know, is it, is it really detectable or does it be converted to something else? Anyway, that's really interesting as well. And um, what role do lichens and biological soil, soil crust play, play in preventing weed establishment? 
um, if you walk around on the ground, you, you know, you see all these like, you know, really thick carpets of biological soil crust and lichens and, you know, it, there's a lot to be um, looked at whether, um, you know, how that, how that is all interplaying with, with um, weeds and, and um, soil structure. And um, another thing would be interesting would be um, looking at how, how ungulates, you know, to what extent they're using it as, as forage at MPG Ranch and MPG North, and and also looking at um, sagebrush communities and, and seeing, um, you know, when are these lichens coming in? You know, how old are these stands that are are supporting these lichens that are found more in the forest, and and what factors are contributing, and what species are, are kind of the you know the ruderal species in colonizing this, and and then the same with um, you know what species are coming in in you know in areas that are have been harvested or or altered you know same with the soil it was really interesting to find um, you know out out in these grasslands with zero plant diversity and just all you know exotic grasses you know you use fat wow here's a lichen and it's growing in, and so it's really interesting too to, to see what you know what's coming in and um, and the interaction um, with the rest of the community as well and so, some supporting liter literature that can't read, but um, again, um, he, like I said, if, if you're interested in this, um, this in its entirety, it's on the web. And I'd just like to thank um, Philip and Nate and Mel for their support in this project, and that concludes my talk. Thank you.